The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Dan Fiorentino. I'm one of the partners here at Wolken Gut and Plan. Welcome to today's webinar titled, What's New with the P3? and an intro to the Main Street Lending Program. Today's webinar is really intended as a follow-up to the one that we did a while back on April 3rd. It seems like forever ago. During that presentation, we really dove into the weeds of the Payroll Protection Program. Since then, some new information has come out, so we wanted to give you a high overview of the updates to our interpretations. And at the end of this, we'll also talk about the Main Street Lending Program that was announced last week. Just like last time, our presenters for today are going to be Bill McDivitt and Len Nitty two partners here at Wolken Gun Plan. Before we jump into the actual presentation, just some housekeeping items for you. Again, the content of this webinar is going to be based on the information that was available yesterday as of April 13th. We said it a lot last time during our webinar, but information is continuously being released from the government on this topic. So what's our interpretation today could be a little bit different in a couple of days if more information is released. Stay connected to us for the latest updates, but as of right now, we're good through April 13th. If you have any questions when we're going through this, you can use the questions pane in the GoToWebinar dashboard on your screen you see right there. Um, last time we had a lot of questions, so this time I think we're actually going to extend the webinar for an extra 10 minutes. So the invitation said 30 minutes, we're actually going to go for 40 minutes. If you have a hard stop and you can't stick around for those last 10 minutes, don't worry. We're going to post the webinar to our website at the end of this so you can catch those last 10 minutes. In addition to a copy of the webinar, there's a lot of good resources on our website, so make sure you check that out if you haven't yet. It's a very good resource center for all the uh, COVID-19 updates. In addition to the actual webinar, we'll post a copy of the slide deck on our website. And I believe you can actually download, if you look at your go-to webinar meeting, you can currently download a copy of the presentation right now. When we did our webinar a few weeks back, we had a lot of people request copies of the slide deck. So to make it a little bit easier, we decided to include that whole slide deck in today's presentation with some updates, obviously, in addition to that. But now you'll have the complete picture if you choose to download that webinar presentation right there. Okay. As I said, a lot of information is changing and constantly being updated on this, so much that the Treasury actually last week released one of their questions on this, basically saying, hey, if I already did my application based on the facts and circumstances as of that date, do I need to update it now that you guys released more information? Essentially, they said, nope, don't worry about it. So before I hand this off to Bill, just a quick recap of our agenda. The first couple items you'll see are recaps of the last time we did this. Um, overview of the P3, understanding payroll costs, calculating the loan amount, and then loan forgiveness and the loan application process. We'll just give you a general high level view of what's changed in each of those areas and follow that up with a brief introduction to the Main Street Lending Program. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Bill. Um, Bill, <laughs> hopefully you can hear me loud and clear. Yep, I can hear you, Dan. Thank Perfect. you. Okay, so um, we put up a fresh headline, which is as sobering as the headline we had last time. Um, as of last week, um, 17 million Americans filed unemployment claims in a three-week period of time, which is somewhat unbelievable. Um, you know, today is uh, April the 14th, if you can go forward, Dan. It's only two and a half weeks since the CARES Act was passed. And there's been a lot of guidance that's been provided in that two and a half weeks. You can see on that timeline there. Um, so there are sometimes the guidance is conflicting with other guidance that's been received, and there will be more guidance to come. And this whole area has been ripe for misinterpretations and, and alternative interpretations and rumors. Um, you know, we think that we have our handle on what it is the SBA is looking for and what the banks are looking for. And we're going to focus, as Dan points, pointed out, on just the changes as we go along. On the next slide, uh, you will see um, – go back. Sorry about that, Bill. It's okay. Computer lag. We're having issues again here. <laughs> there you go. You'll see links to um, the SBA, the Treasury, and the Federal Reserve. Um, I go to that Treasury uh, page a couple times a day because they're constantly updating it with information. And since you'll have the slide that you can all do the same if you'd like. Um, move forward, please. I keep going. Okay, so originally this program was set up with $349 billion of funding. Um, seems like an awful lot of money, but most of us who looked at this and thought about how many businesses there were in the country came to the conclusion that it is possible that this program could be oversubscribed. The SBA has um, clearly indicated that this will not be allocated pro rata. It's going to be 
on a first come first serve basis. So, um, you know, it's imperative that if you don't have your application in that you get it in very quickly. And if you do have your application and you need to kind of push it along to the extent that's possible. As of 11.45 today, I heard from the SBA that 253 billion of the 349 billion has been committed, um, leaving less than 100 billion in the program. And on average in the past uh, week or so, they've been running an average of 30 billion a day. So it's possible that this program can be fully subscribed by late this week or early next week. So it's important to uh, move quickly. The other thing that um, may be happening is that there's been discussions and almost everyone's in agreement that they may allocate another 250 billion to this program. Um, but at this point, it ha would have to go through the House and the Senate. And um, who knows if that'll happen or if it does happen, when it will happen. So recent guidance um, tells us that sole proprietors on their own can apply for P3, um, P3 loans. Look forward. And again. And um, the other thing that uh, came up that was relatively new was we were concerned if, uh, if an employer used the PEO or an employee leasing company or had temporary staff, whether or not they would count. Um, and since our last webinar, we've received confirmation from the SBA that a PEO, employee leasing, and temporary staff um, would, would be counted. Uh, the other thing that they clarified, if you see on the bottom, it's highlighted in green, um, that the payment of state and local employer taxes will be included in addition to the salaries, but um, this payment of state of federal employment taxes are not counted. There had been some confusion about that. Slide ahead, please. One more. Um, no, stop here for a second. So, so this basically is telling us that employers cannot um, deduct the expenses they may pay to a sole proprietor. But as I mentioned before, the sole proprietors themselves can apply for a P3 loan. So I guess this kind of makes sense because you, if the employer could take um, the uh, the payment and the, uh, the independent contractor can take the payment that would be in effect a double up. So this kind of makes sense. So the independent contractors themselves can can do this. Uh, there's really um, some confusion about how an independent contractor would would do this. So we think that they would basically take their 2019 net schedule C and um, divide that by 12 to get their average monthly payroll. Slide forward. So this, um, this slide confirms two things. One is, and I don't think I mentioned this earlier, is that the cap of 100,000 is just on salary. And you can add to the salary for someone who's over um, 100,000 of salary, any health insurance benefits that are applicable to that employee um, that are paid by the employer, any retirement benefits uh, paid up on behalf of that employee, and any state and local um, employer payroll taxes. And in earlier, um, at our last presentation, where it was not fully clear whether that $100,000 cap was a cap on everything together or just on salary, and then you could add the other items. The other thing which is highlighted in green here is a somewhat confusing section of the law, which led many folks to believe that you had to use net payroll um, to calculate the loan, and it's quite clear that you use gross payroll. And then on the uh, the other side of forgiveness, um, we'll, uh, Lenny will deal with that um, issue later. Um, but some folks actually were adding employer federal taxes, and we mentioned on the last slide, you can only add the state and local taxes, not the employer taxes. So this is basically um, the math. You figure out the average monthly um, payroll, you multiply it by two and a half times, and you get a number. If it's under 10 million, that's the amount of the loan you can get. If it's over 10 million, you're capped to 10 million. The other thing that has been clarified is that the uh, SBA has suggested that you can use calendar 2019 as opposed to the most recent 12 months. 
Um, and many of the financial institutions um, are willing to accept that. Um, there are a few outliers who do not accept that. So this, uh, at this point, we're going to turn it over to, to Len Nitty. Thank you, Bill. So hopefully most of you are at the point where you've had your application submitted and perhaps even some of you have started to have them approved and maybe even have actually received some loan proceeds from, from the bank as part of this program. So the next logical question is, you know, how can you actually use the loan proceeds? Um, one thing we're going to recommend before I get into how you use this is you may want to receive the loan proceeds in a separate bank account, a new bank account. Um, this way you can track exactly how it's being spent and you can show the government or the bank when the time comes that you did spend it appropriately rather than having it go into an operating fund that may get commingled with other expenses and make it a little more tricky to um, to track. So the government gives us seven different available uses of the proceeds. Payroll costs is bill previously defined and was on the slides. Group health care benefits during periods of sick medical or family leave, mortgage interest expense payments, um, rent payments, utility payments, interest payments on any other debt obligations incurred before uh, February 15th of 2020, and refinancing of an SBA EIDL loan. You'll notice that three of these are highlighted in green um, because when you actually get to forgiveness, there's only four types of expenses that are going to be forgiven. So that's going to be payroll costs, mortgage interest payments, rent payments, and utility payments. Presumably, even though it's been separately stated and identified, group health care benefits during periods of sick, medical, or family leave, in our opinion, should be included as payroll costs because um, defined in payroll costs are, you know, sick, medical, and family leave pay plus group health benefits anyhow. We're not quite sure why that was separately targeted here, but it does seem reasonable to expect that that could qualify for forgiveness. Um, and then we get down to the bottom two where you have interest payments on any other debt obligations. These are not going to be forgivable if you use it for these payments. Um, and refinancing of SB, SBA EIDL loan amounts um, may not be forgiven as well. So, Dan, if you want to flip to the, the next slide. So for loan forgiveness, we said you have the four different types of costs that you can pay, and you have to do this within an eight-week week period. Um, and that begins on the date that the loan is originated and you receive the proceeds. You have eight weeks to spend it. For payroll costs, there was a lot of confusion the last time. And the way that the law was written, it almost suggested as if you would use gross pay to calculate the loan amount, but might have to be using net pay on the back end. Uh, the SBA has clarified this now, and it's gross pay for the forgiveness also. So you don't have to reduce it for employee taxes withheld, whether they're social security, federal income withholdings, um, or railroad benefits. So that, that's that's great news in terms of it being gross pay now as well. Um, you must still, you must use at least 75% of the proceeds to pay payroll costs. So this, this is in the interim final rule um, and interim final guidance. So make sure that you are using at least 75% of that on payroll costs. It, it is good to note that if you had an SBA EIDL loan um, that you were using for payroll costs, the payroll costs associated with that loan can be included as part of meeting the 75% test. So if you go forward one, Dan. Um, in terms of loan forgiveness, they re the government is mandating that, that you effectively maintain your level of employment, same number of employees and very similar level of compensation being paid to everybody. So if you're unable to, to do that or your, your number of full-time equivalent employees dips at all, you may be, entire, you may be receiving a um, lesser amount of forgiveness. So it's basically a, a mathematical formula where you're looking at what are your average full-time employees during the eight week covered period Compare it to where you have historically been, and you know if you're not at 100%, then 
you're going to see your forgiveness amount go down potentially with, with one exception. And then if you go to the next slide, talks a little bit about reduction in salary of wages. They don't want you to reduce anyone's salary um, by in excess of 25%. If you reduce salaries in excess of 25%, um, you're potentially gonna have a, a lower amount of forgiveness as well. Um, there is one exception to the rule here is that if you have somebody who's being paid in excess of $100,000 on an annualized basis in any period during the last year, um, they, you can reduce their salaries by more than 25% and still qualify for this. Um, but when you think about it, since 75% of the proceeds have to be used for payroll costs and you only have eight weeks to spend it, it's gonna be very difficult to have a reduction in employee salaries and still meet this test, um, the 75% test. So this may be less of an issue um, than we originally thought. There is an exception to these two phase out rules for rehires. Um, you have essentially until June 30th to eliminate the reduction in the full-time equivalents and also eliminate the reduction in salary or wages being paid to the employees. In order, in order to request forgiveness, you're gonna re, uh, submit a request to the lender and you're gonna need to include certain documentation to verify um why you qualify for forgiveness you're going to be needing to document the number of full-time equivalent empo employees and pay rates um, provide them payroll schedules to support that also show proof of payments on eligible mortgages leases and utility obligations um, and you're going to need to certify that the documents that you're providing are true and then the lender has 60 days to uh, request forgiveness or grant forgiveness we had also said last time that the um, the amount of the debt forgiveness will be excluded from gross income for federal purposes. Uh, the one thing that we're waiting on further guidance or clarification for is whether or not the expenses being paid would be deductible. There are some sections of the tax law where, where you have tax exempt income and if this is deemed to be tax exempt income, where you would have to reduce the associated expenses being paid with that income um, from being deductible. So we're waiting on further guidance from that. And we should have that guidance when they do give us uh, additional guidance on loan forgiveness. Go ahead, Dan. So I, I don't wanna go through this in detail, but this is within the, the law and the, the interim final guidance, what you should expect to be um, providing the lender in terms of documentation to prove that you incurred the expenses and use the loan proceeds properly. Um, other things about forgiveness, the interest rate on the loan is 1%, but to the extent that the loan is forgiven, the interest is also forgiven. Um, the loan is due in two years from the date it is granted, although payments are deferred for the first six months, um, although interest continues to accrue, and there are no prepayment penalties or fees should you decide to pay early. So I think I hit this already earlier, but you know, from the frequently asked questions that the SBA has provided, when does the eight week period begin? It effectively begins on the day that you receive the loan proceeds, when the lender first makes a dis disbursement to you. So we have a number of unanswered questions for loan forgiveness that hopefully will be addressed in the next couple of weeks. Um, when the, the law was passed, the CARES Act was passed, they gave Treasury 30 days from the date of enactment, which was March 27th, to issue additional guidance on loan forgiveness. So here are a few big questions that we see unanswered and hopefully we get clarification on these soon as they are gonna be pretty critical. So our employer is gonna be entitled to any relief if employees refuse to come off of unemployment. We have a lot of employers that have had to close the doors and weren't able to afford to continue to pay their employees. So their employees are collecting unemployment or have at least applied for unemployment. And with the increased unemployment amounts with the federal subsidy, how easy is it gonna to be to get some of these employees to come off unemployment? And will these employers who get PPP loans be, uh, be penalized for that? 
What about treatment of payroll costs for employees earning over 100,000 during the covered period? Is only 8,333 8, per month gonna qualify for forgiveness? Um, or will you be able to include as payroll costs anything that you're paying to these employees? I think that's an important unanswered question um, that we're gonna have to hopefully get answers sooner rather than later. There really is no guidance on how loan forgiveness would work for a sole proprietor or an independent contractor. Uh, you know, presumably you may have independent contractors that are receiving no income right now. So will this, will these PPP loans essentially be allowed to replace the independent contractor's income and automatically qualify for forgiveness? It's, it's an unanswered question that will become important to, to these types of businesses. Um, what if you're, you're short on the amount of the loan proceeds being used for payroll requirements? Could you give an employee an advance to meet the 75% test and still qualify for forgiveness within that eight week period? Um, another important question. And I address this on the last slide. Um, will expenses paid with the PPP proceeds be deductible? Hopefully they give us a favorable answer there. And it, it all depends upon what level of, of benefit or incentive they want to give to employers for bringing people back to work. There's a number of different sections of the code which treat incentives differently. Sometimes they require a direct dollar for dollar reduction of expenses for benefits received. Sometimes it's 50% and other sections of the code require, um, don't require any reduction at all of the expenses when you're receiving a credit or a um, tax exempt income. So good news is hopefully within the next couple of weeks, we'll have these answers based on the 30 day requirement when the CARES Act was initiated. Um, when we do get additional guidance on loan forgiveness, we will quickly do another webinar on this because I'm sure this is gonna be an important question on most of your minds, um, making sure that you get the maximum amount to qualify for loan forgiveness and take full advantage of this PPP program. And I think with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Bill to uh, quickly talk about the application process and then give you a little information on the new Main Street Lending Program. Thank you, Len. Okay, so um, these dates have already passed. Um, on the third, um, small businesses and sole proprietorships were allowed to apply um, this past Friday. Independent contractors and self-employeds were allowed to apply. And uh, as I think I mentioned earlier, I know I mentioned earlier, 75% um, of the allocation of this money is gone already. And the balance may be gone um, in the near term. It could be gone late this week or early next week. Uh, and then once that happens, um, I'm not sure what's gonna happen with applications that are in the queue as we're waiting for the potential additional 250 to be allotted by Congress and hopefully sign it to law. So if we can move forward, um, this is the um, loan application. Hopefully all of you have seen this already because you've already submitted. If you haven't, I would encourage you to um, get it done expeditiously. Um, if we just focused in on the top of the form. You can go back then. We focused in on the top of the form to show you how, how simple the form is. There's a couple of other sections to the form that we're not gonna go through right now, but the main number that drives this whole thing is what's your average monthly payroll, which we talked about the math of how you get there and you get a loan of two and a half times that. So you can move forward. So we, we've had a lot of conversations with our friends in the banking industry, and you know they, they have been wrestling with this, um, just like the SBA has been wrestling with this, and all the folks in the business community have been ref wrestling with this, and different lenders have taken different positions, um, but what is absolutely clear now is these are the steps of getting your, um, E3 loan approved. Step one is that the business submits an application and some supporting documentation to the bank. Hopefully you've all done that. Step two is the bank reviews and approves the application and supporting documentation. Step three is the bank uploads the application to the SBA via something called the eTrans system. That's the SBA's um, computer system that interfaces with the banking industry. This particular step has been a real bottleneck because, of, as you can imagine, the demand for these loans is pretty high. Uh, the system probably was not built for this kind of demand. So that this particular step has been causing a real bottleneck. 
some of the bankers I've been speaking to are actually putting staff on odd hours. They start at six at night and work through the night um, just so that there's a little less demand on the system and they can get uh, their stuff in. Uh, others are working weekends and, and such. Step four is the critical step. Um, step four is once the bank has uploaded to the SBA, then the SBA approves the application and assigns a number. They communicate this back to the bank, and at this point, you have a locked-in P3 loan. Whether you know you might get funded still in another week or two, but it, when step four is completed and the SBA has approved your application and sends it back to your bank. At this point, you have money that's locked in for you and cannot be taken away. The, the fifth step, which could take anywhere from a half a week to a week and a half, is getting loan documents executed between you and the lending institution. And then after those documents are executed, funding and the timing on this will depend on the, on the bank. So here, we're just wrapping up the, just, you know, we wrapped up the P3 program. Um, and we're moving on to something called the Main Street Lending Program, which was initiated by the Federal Reserve. This program was designed to help employers who were boxed out of the P3 loan lending program because of the numbers of employees that they have. So um, the Federal Reserve is, is creating a new program for um, employers who have above that 500 employee situation. Um, you can also, if you have a P3 loan, apply for a Main Street loan. So it qualifies. You could have anywhere from one employee up to 10,000 employees, and you'll qualify. And you can have up to $2.5 billion in 2019 revenue and qualify for this plan. So, so how is Main Street, dif uh, Main Street Lending Program different than the Payroll Protection, I'm sorry, Paycheck Protection Program? Um, the P3 loans are forgivable, and the Main Street loans are real loans and are not forgivable. So obviously the P3 loans are incredibly attractive because of that forgivable forgiveness feature. Um, I'm not sure, so sure how uh, popular the Main Street Lending Program will be, but if needed, this can inject liquidity into the business. And then normally with an SBA loan, you apply to the government for a loan. Again, this program, uh, just like P3, you will be applying to a bank to obtain the loan which is not typical for the SBA loan process. So this is similar to the P3 loan in that you go to the banks to, to make these loans. And can a business have both a P3 loan and a Main Street loan? And the answer to that is yes. So what are some of the other details um, on the Main Street loans? The minimum loan size is a million dollars and the maturity is for no more than four years. Principal and interest payments can be deferred for a full year. And the interest rate um, is basically the secured overnight financing rate, which is almost zero, plus between two and a half uh, to 4%. So basically these loans will carry a rate of between two and a half percent and 4%. There is an upfront origination fee that has to be paid by the borrower of 1% of the loan. Um, the loans can be paid off early without a penalty and they can't be used to, um, to repay or refinance pre-existing loans or lines of credit. So the Main Street Lending Program has two different facilities. One is a new loan facility and the other is an extension of a, an existing facility. I'm gonna assume that most folks listening to this probably don't have um, the old program, so we're focused here on the new facility. And the maximum loan is the lesser of 200, I'm sorry, 25 million, or basically uh, four times uh, the borrower's 2019 EBITDA. EBITDA is earnings before interest, taxes, and depreciation and amortization. And when you count that four times pocket, you count what you're asking for is the new Main Street loan plus your existing outstanding debt, plus your available debt to the extent you have a uh, line of credit in place. And th this is one that kind of chases a, some many public companies away, recipients, um, cannot pay dividends or buy back stock while the loan is outstanding and for 12 months after the loan's been paid off. And this uh, next provision also prohibits um, paid executives who compensation, whose compensation exceeds 425000 in 2019 from being increased. Next slide. And there are a number of attestations that um, someone who borrows from the program must, uh, must sign off on. These are 
in many instances, similar to the attestations that you're signing off on relative to P3, uh, but there are some slight differences. I'm not going to take the time to read uh, line by line through this. And that Are you also up, done with Main Street, Bill? Yeah, I think it opens up things for questions. We just yep. passed the comments. Okay, yeah, so as I said, we're already hit our allotted time of 30 minutes. We'll stay around for a couple more minutes though so we can answer some of your questions on here. Um, so let me go through this for Bill and Len. One question we have on here, in regards to the payroll, and I know there's gonna be additional regulations coming out regarding the forgiveness, but do you think the payroll will be based more on accrual or cash basis in terms of timing? I think this is one we don't have an answer on yet. And we're gonna to have yeah. to wait for that additional guidance. Gotcha, okay. I see a lot of people are asking also about bonus amounts too and how those are gonna be handled. Any thoughts or just gotta wait? Yeah. My, my, well, the answer really is let's see the guidance, which hopefully we'll have in the next 12 days. But if you think about it conceptually, when you look backwards at 2019 and you captured a whole year's worth of pay for, for your staff, you would have captured their base pay plus bonuses. So if we're going to be um, fair in how we equate things, there, there probably should be some mechanism there to allow either bonuses to be paid or portions of bonuses to be paid that are pro rata in connection with the eight weeks pay. But that's pure speculation on my part. Um, you will have to see what the uh, forgiveness guidance says. Gotcha, okay. What kind of turnaround times are you guys seeing with the banks? It's probably a range I would think, right? And the application process? Yeah, I, I think it really depends on the bank. Um, you know, the size of the bank and how many applications they have in and whether they were an SBA lender originally or whether they're newly assigned, there's just so many variables. <clears throat> um, I know a lot of banks had a lot of trouble in the very beginning, kind of getting geared up and, and, and executing on this. And, and now most banks are, are really fully functional and, and are doing well on their end. Uh, the problem is, as I mentioned earlier, is in that step three, I believe it was, trying to upload these applications that the bank has approved to the SBA via that eTran uh, portal. And, and that's created a real bottleneck for, for everyone. Okay. I know you guys touched upon this during the presentation, but we did have a couple questions come on this. Can you just reiterate the uh, gross versus net payroll issue? Sure, I, I can take that. Um, and presumably this may be, well, I guess it's in terms of both payroll costs on the front end and also in forgiveness. There, were, there was a lot of confusion when the law came out and some of the major payroll companies interpretation of this kind of swayed the world as well, where there was confusion as to whether you would work off of gross pay or whether you would reduce gross pay by social, employee social security withholdings and federal income tax withholdings. The uh, Treasury and the SBA have come out and told us everything is based on a gross pay basis. When you're calculating the pay, payroll cost for purposes of obtaining the loan, and also when you're doing your calculations and making your payments for forgiveness, both sides will be both based on gross pay. Gotcha, okay, thank you very much for that. Okay, and we'll take one more question on here. In terms of the accrued interest, which you may have actually mentioned that as well, but if you can reiterate, is that getting forgiven, the accrued interest on the loan? To the extent that the principal of the loan is forgiven, uh, yes, the interest associated with that principal also is. If you're not, um, if all of the principal is not forgiven, there would still be the 1% interest accruing on that and needing to be, be paid. Gotcha, okay, perfect. I know we did already run over a couple more minutes, so I think we're gonna try to wrap this up unless you guys have any closing remarks first. No. Is that, okay. So in case you haven't seen from us, um, we are holding another webinar actually this Thursday regarding the tax provisions of the CARES Act. It's gonna be very informative. So if you haven't signed up for that one, I highly encourage you to. It's gonna be a different topic than this one, but still very important. So thank you again for everyone for signing on today. You can get a copy of this recording and any other information you need for COVID-19 from the Wilkin Gutten Plan website. We'll talk to you guys soon. Thanks.